Welcome to How to Rock the Stage Show, a show committed to equipping you to hone your media skills better to stand out from the crowd as a go-to expert in your field. Each week, Rich Montreger interviews top leaders, influencers, authors, speakers, podcasters, and media professionals about how to leverage media best to help you shine brighter on camera and stage as a go-to expert. Now, here's your host, The Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome to Rock the Stage Show, back once again, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And tonight, you're in for a treat. Usually, we have one amazing rock star guest. Tonight, we're doing the best stuff. And we had to be kind of select, but we're bringing you not just one, not just two, but three featured guests from throughout 2023. These different speakers, leaders, influencers brought an extra energy and information to the show. And you're going to benefit from three experts tonight, all in one show. So be sure to stick around for that. We do want to thank Adavita Studios for making this all possible. Adavita sponsors and partners with Rock the Stage Media. Adavita has an experienced team paired with the state-of-the-art remote recording processes that brings your message to the market fast. They will work with you to produce your audio books, your podcast series, and distribute it widely out there in the market. If you want to learn more about Adavita, go to adavitastudios.com. Thank you, Adavita, for being a big part of what we do at Rock the Stage. And again, they're going to take our show and turn that into a podcast as well. They power our show. Tonight, it is going to be the best of 2023, and we could have picked a ton of different guests, a lot of different amazing guests we've had. But these three guests are a little bit special, spice things up, and they cover different sectors and different areas. First up tonight, we're going to talk to Robin Creaseman. Robin is a masterful musician, performance coach, keynote speaker, two-time Emmy Award winner, 17-time Telly Award winner in television, He's best known as the rock star speaker and performance coach with 25 years of experience in music, television, speaking, and the entertainment industry. We're going to jump into this once again. We were talking about how public speaking can really be about rocking your stage and how to create an experience by developing your presentation and learning from TV and film directors. So as we pick up the conversation here tonight, we're going to get back into it. And we're talking about thinking like a film director. Here, once again, is Robin Creaseman from our episode that we titled Four Ways to Stand Out on Stage and Present Like a Rock Star. Let's so, get into directing because I love the idea of uh, the actor rehearsing. There is something about knowing it so well. You can do it in your sleep, but you don't do it in your sleep. But you do. This is performance. 100%. So a lot of people come, you know, say, Robin, we can't write this out because I'm not going to memorize this. No, I agree 100%. Like you said, you know the intro, your opening, like the back of your hand, and you know your closing, like at the back of the hand. The beginnings and endings are crucial in everything we do. In our in everyday life, when we meet somebody, our first impressions matter and our ending impression, our last impression matters. So that's important for this as well. And then you've got to make sure that you know your stories. And I like to say go from 2D to 3D. Get away from just the flat, you know, telling a story. Act it out. Almost, in, you know, really physically move on the stage. Act it out. If you're in a conversation in the story, act out the conversation on the stage. Play the two it's, parts. Play the two parts. It engages people. You know, I remember that back in the day, a lot of times, um, you know, people would be on the phone. Well, they still are on the phone. All of a sudden, when you're on you're talking and they're doing that. And all of a sudden he said, you know, it was last 30th Tuesday. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. It was pouring down rain. And all of a sudden, and all of a sudden they're doing this themselves. Last Thursday at two o'clock, their heads come up on a story there. It, it brings them back to life. Well, you never will even lose them if you're going to, if you do what I'm suggesting you do. And that's being completely engaging. And what you've done, you, because of the director and the producer way back when you are producing Every seven to nine minutes. Yes. You And those are standalone segments, just like a television show. Yes. Television show, a 60-minute television show is really 42 to 45 minutes, interrupted by six minutes, I mean, six different commercials for two or four minutes, depending now what the, the, the number is. But you've got a beginning, middle, and end of each segment. 
the beginning's got to be great to keep them watching. It's got to continue on, have a you know very active middle and then a enticing close where they go, wait, what just happened? Because they're going away to a commercial break, right? They yes. come back from the commercial break and they've got to be, do I still want to watch this? Oh, wow, what's going on? And then what, what, at the end, what, why, how did that happen? And they go to another commercial break. Well, that's the way we produce, we should be producing our keynotes. It's in segments and you've rehearsed each segment and you know it like the back of your hand. Then you add the next segment, then the next segment. Now you are rehearsing a whole presentation. And the only way that you're going to get better is to practice, practice, practice. But you're going to rehearse, record, review, start over. Rehearse, record, review, and, and start over. And you do that, and you do that, and you do it. When I mean record, I mean now we all have cameras or, you know, that we can record for Zoom, things like that. Record yourself doing a segment. Watch it. Review it. Ah, that didn't really work. I need to change this. Get that segment down. Go to the next one. Get it down. Then do half the presentation as a full let roll. And then retweak that. And then do the whole program. And then do that several times so that you know that you know that you know what you're doing for 45 to 55, 60 minutes. Well, and also there's that roller coaster. Like you said, you want to take them on a journey. So you can't stay here the whole time. And no one wants no, no, you no, to no. be here. So you have to learn how to have that roller coaster. And yeah. sight, sound, taste, smell. When you storytell it, when you act it out, make it a sensory experience. Draw yeah. them into your experience with you. Each segment is a beginning, middle, and end, and it is a roller coaster. You have to keep that going on. Some are high energy. Think about a concert. You start big and you end bigger. And then the second song, third song, it's still, still pretty up. They're still really good. And then they might stop and they do a little break, talk a moment, and then they do a, a ballad, maybe something to slow it down. And then they bring it back up to another mid-tempo stuff that's real active. Then they go crazy with the jam session, and then they break that down, and they do what I call the memorable middle. It's the unplug section. In a speech, I call it the memorable middle. But that's when a lot of the artists will put yeah. down their, their electric instruments, go about in the middle of the Coliseum on a rising stage that comes up, and their piano, acoustic piano, acoustic guitars, and they go intimate for a little while. People are loving it because, number one, it's now closer to them, and it's different, and it changes the sensory idea of being overloaded. And then they come back from that. Then they take the last 20, 30 minutes, and they have another roller coaster, ultimately – you know, building up to the big uh, encore. So yeah, you've got to make that happen. And so that's what you're doing in your direction upstage, you know, when you're staging the scene and you're creating with your writing, you're thinking about this roller coaster effect of these modules. How do you put that together? So when you put it all together, big wow moment for the first eight or nine, 10 minutes uh, that takes you through the first segment completely. Then you might change the pace a little bit there about 15 minutes in, and then you work with that. You just kind of move it through. And like you said, music, uh, visuals, stories, can telling. Now, here's a thought, like you mentioned a moment ago, what if there is no PowerPoint? What if you lost your PowerPoint? Can you do your program without it? That's the question I ask my clients. Do you know it well enough? If everything goes, can you keep going? At the yeah. same energy and tempo. That's a great question, Robin. And a lot of times when people have had that happen to them and they've done it, they said it felt better without it because it was more organic. And then there's the concept, well, what if I plan to do it without a PowerPoint? Like what you were talking a minute ago. Yeah. Where it's so interactive, so engaging, so personality driven um, uh, high energy, heartfelt, maybe you go and get a stool and you come down and you sit at the front of the stage and the two thirds of the way in and you, you go, you know what? I gotta, I gotta tell you this story. It's amazing. Vince Pacenti, you know, Vince Pacenti, Hall yeah. of Fame speaker and a downhill skier, Canadian Olympic skier. Uh, I did a lot of his videos early in the day. He's wonderful. He's one of the best speakers I've ever seen. He's amazing. Well, back in the day when he was doing basically his Olympic story, he started on top of a chair. He stood on a, a, just a chair in the hall and he was acting out his skiing. He's a, all right, you're down on the, you're going there, you're going through, you're, you're going skiing. It's, you know, he's acting that out. 
And it's, it's right at the top of the skis. So you're on the side of the mountain, about to be in the Olympics. You're waiting for the bell to go. And I'm bang, and you got two minutes. And man, it's so intense. It was just, wow. And people stood, standing ovation at that moment, within the first three minutes of his presentation. Now, back toward the latter part of his presentation, he's telling a story about his dad. He overheard his dad talking to a friend on the phone, telling his friend how proud he was of his son, of what he did to get to the Olympics, going from a recreational skier to an Olympic skier in three years, at starting at 26 years old. And it's very intimate. And Vince gets kind of emotional during mm -hmm. that period of time. Yeah. And you think, well, how does that connect with people? Well, it just did. First of all, it connected with the meeting planners who they got so, a lot of them are, are, are ladies and a lot of even the, the guys. It's an, I'll get emotional. It was an intimate moment where he was vulnerable and he shared something special to him. And yeah. we all have had, you know, hopefully those kind of moments in our life and we can relate back to it. And then, you know, before we know it, he's bringing it back up again and have another big Olympic thing. So, you know, he uses a few little images every once in a while, but most everything he did is without PowerPoint. And it was brilliant. He's now gone into another little lane of his topic, but he's still an amazing speaker. But why not? Why not think different? Well, and, and we still got one more point to get into, but I, I want to clarify here that intensity to the mellow to the to the intimacy there's a piece in here called transition yep. and if you watch tv movies film there's a transition you don't just break it off and do it either it would be like slamming on your face and going through the car windshield there is a transition <laughs> and part of the artistry of public speaking is you need to learn the art of transition yeah you you, you just can't go okay. bang 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 and say I got through my talk. No, there is a transition piece. So grab a stool, sit down, come close to the stage, do something for a moment that gives them time to get ready for it and then pull them back out of it deeply, differently, because otherwise it's going to snap their heads off, right? Yeah. Yes, without a doubt. And again, that goes back early on in that director and writing sessions where you are crafting this out. And my keynote that I was doing the last couple of years, Rock Your Customer, um, there's a segment in there. It's all about communication, performance, and connection. And there's a segment in there. I tell a story about my dad, who uh, was a pastor for a number of years in five of the largest Baptist churches in America as an education associate pastor. He was known as a church growth expert, and he was a people pastor, and he loved on people. And I'm talking about this because he ended up getting Alzheimer's, and he lost a lot of his memory. He knew everyone's name. He could tell everyone's name. Well, as I begin to tell that story, I've got some music going underneath there that's very ah, inspirational and heartwarming and just soothes you, and it set the tone. And the very first time I did it, it was for about 600 realtors in the state of Arizona for their state conference. And um, it was toward the end. And I typically end with uh, my Paul McCartney story and I do some Beatle music and stuff. But I decided to end that day with this story without thinking. And it was so transitional that heartfelt that people were getting emotional and me telling the story, how wonderful my dad was and how he um, loved on people. And I told some stories about that. And yet now he's lost his memory and he had just passed away. And I'm sharing all that. I didn't realize the impact that that had. And I've heard so many wonderful things about that. Except, and this is an, an unusual, unusual exception, I didn't do it like I should have done it in the program. Because my meeting planners, I was the opening keynote, they wanted me to come in and rock the stage, right? And they wanted me to have that big high energy thing at the end and, you know, rah, rah. Well, I kind of left them on an, an emotional moment. I didn't realize it was going to be that emotional. I realized it in the moment on stage and I tried to, you know, vamp it and turn around and, you know, kind of bring it back up. I had some interaction with the audience that I wouldn't typically have done at the end, challenging them to go out and interact with the people while we're at the conference for the next three days. And uh, it was, it worked, it worked. But in talking to my uh, meeting planners at the end of it, I said, we loved that. We loved it. Ah, I wish it had been 
you know, I do twist and shout, shake it up, baby, trying to get everybody to shake it up and all that stuff. And I tell my Paul McCartney story and all this stuff. And it's really fun. Everyone's standing and dancing. They wished it had been that, but they loved what I did. Right. So you got to be careful because I wasn't uh, aware that it was going to be that strong. And I've changed it since then to not go to the end, number one, but also change it around. But what a great conversation. And super important there, very close to the end, about honoring the event planners. I've not heard that talked about very often at any interview, any talk show, any training I've ever been at. But as Robin was saying, it's essential to make sure you pause and reflect and remember to honor the speakers. They're the ones that help to get those jobs done by having those event planners on your side. Let's move on. Our second great speaker here tonight, we are going back to February the 2nd. 2023, a Wednesday night show, high energy, rich in conversation. Lindsay Dowd was our guest that night. She is recognized by Apple News as the top 10 coach for 2023. She is a speaker and the founder of the chief heartbeat officer of a company called Heartbeat for Hire. Lindsay has 25 plus years in sales and management. She is an accomplished leader, decorated seller, and successfully managed large cross-brand, diverse, high-performance sales teams. 23 of these years, by the way, were spent at IBM. And as we get back into her interview tonight, we're going to pick up talking about that culture of leadership and how to create a high employee retention with good leadership and vibrant company culture. And we pick up talking about my memories of IBM and hers. So going back to IBM, I lived in Rochester, Ooh. Minnesota for a very yeah. long time. The heartbeat of Big Blue. When Big Blue was mm -hmm. at its prime, Rochester was part of the biggest hub of IBM. So I'm very familiar with the culture. Um, and it's interesting. You come out of that culture to be a very creative. Yeah. And like you said, that's a big jump. Because IBM was not going to allow you to escape <laughs> the clicker. <laughs> there was no you know, room for creative. I, I'll, I'll comment on that because I came from Lotus and Lotus was definitely more of the creative wilder side of IBM. And I have a very long legacy at IBM. My family put in like 105 years. So my father was an IBMer, my father-in-law, my husband, my mother-in-law. It was a lot of a lot of time we all spent there. So I grew up in that culture. And while I certainly remember the time that my father was wearing the suits and, you know, the day that they were allowed to wear blue shirts was a big deal. Deal. And, you know, here comes Lotus and flip flops and dreadlocks and beer carts on Friday. And my father's like, what is happening? And I'm like, oh, you're going casual. He was like, no way. But what what that fostered was a uh, embracing of different thinking. And um, IBM was a really diverse place, which I really appreciated. And um, I was very fortunate to work for some amazing leaders who gave me the space and the latitude to think differently. And I always called my team Mavericks and Hustlers. And it was so nice to be a part of that kind of environment, which isn't how people really thought of IBM. So no, no, no. I would want to be on that team. I would be on the Maverick team. Come on. <laughs> yeah, no, it was cool. Really cool. By the way, people are commenting here. And again, the whole entrepreneur thing, that first year of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. People get yeah. it. So let's, let's get in to that for a second here because mm. this whole idea of a leadership is where it all hinges on in, in, in my mind. And one of the things that I often speak on is the four important risks that every leader should take. My number one is care more than other things wise. What do you think of that? Oh, I mean, the thing that I teach with leadership and it's right up right in that sweet spot is um, you, you have to build trust with your people and you do that by asking them how you can be the best manager for them. And when you understand what they need, you can advocate for them. But the, the big mistake that I see in sales all the time is so often they will take the high performers, the ones that are absolutely crushing it, and they'll say, we need to magnify that. Let's make them a manager. But very few people ask the question of why do you want to be a manager? And a lot of those top performers only care about their own wallet. So they don't 
they're not going to be an amazing leader. They're not going to take care of their people. And they're going to say to themselves, why don't these people do it exactly like I did it? And they'll just get very frustrated. And you just create this toxic environment. It's a recipe for disaster. So I always love to ask when I had an opportunity to promote people or to hire managers, that was a really important question to say, you know, why do you want to be a manager? And the people that I promoted and the people that I put in those roles were people that absolutely love their team. And anyone that worked for them would die on the mat for them to this day. And I felt that way about the leaders that I had. So um, continuing that, that it's, it's compassionate leadership, but it's, it's letting people do the job they were hired for. And anyone who's micromanager can't do that. So, um, yeah, I just threw a lot at you on that, but yeah. No, 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 no. Because again, part of what I think you're also describing is part of creating this culture and giving them the right place, right people, right place, right gifts, right talents, yeah. put in the right place in the bus. Right. And when, when they pull them out and say, you're doing so good, let's make a manager out of you. Mm. Again, they're not asking, are you a manager or are you one of those people that's right where you should be? Why do yeah. we do that? Why do we move them? Well, they're doing exactly the best job in the world. So I've got two stories for that. So one, I had this rep and she was phenomenal. She was so good. And she consistently would, would get these million dollar commission checks. I mean, she was a force, but she was very self-aware and she knew she should not be a manager. And I knew she should not be a manager, but some moron told her that her resume looked stale because she was doing the same thing for 10 years. I don't know about you, but if I'm making a million dollar commission check, I'm fine. Like, you don't need to put in some, some self doubt in her and make her feel subpar. I'm sure that person who said it wasn't making million dollar commission checks. So that's just one piece of it. Know who you are, know why you wanna do the job mm -hmm. you're in. That's really, really important. But the other story I wanted to share was I had a leader and she was at IBM. She was a friend of mine and she became my boss. And um, I was telling her what I was doing for this really large client. And I had a strategy and I was really working hard on it. And I started to talk about it. And she said, girl, I've got your back. Now fly. And I just, I got goosebumps then. I have goosebumps now. And what that gave me was the strength the, the motivation and it took away the fear for me to build new best practices, for me to take my big team of 55 people and be like, guys, let's think differently. Let's work with this client in ways we haven't before. She's got our back. If we screw up, she's gonna help us through it, but let's try something new. And that was a real turning point for me for the way that I knew I would always want to lead with those kinds of words. And so when you put that belief in someone and you say, I trust you and do the job you're here to do, I got you. Every time I've ever done that, that person has taken risks. They've risen above, they've become my top performers. And it's just such a good practice. So now you're describing building that culture. Yeah. That leader built the culture of, I got you. Mm -hmm. Go fly, kick butt, take names, whatever you want to say. What is some of the other DNA of building mm -hmm. the culture that leaders should sprinkle in to add to what you're describing? Yeah, I, I have one that is so underused and it's so easy, and that's leveraging recognition. And, you know, as a manager, most managers have some kind of discretionary budget that they can, you know, throw money towards things or you get points in your program or whatever it is. But, um, a simple one is just if you're having a team call, recognizing someone on a supporting team and saying, hey, you guys, we're going to bring Sally on the call today. She absolutely helped us crush this. We need to just celebrate her. She has no idea we're doing this. Let's make her feel good. First of all, Sally is going to be blown away. She's going to be embarrassed. She's going to be excited. She's going to be really touched. But Sally will forever be like, oh no, I love that team. I will help that team always. They totally saw, they saw me, they, they see my value. That's great. So that's an easy one. Another one is just saying, you know, when you're asking that question of how can I be the best manager for you, you learn things about your people. You learn, okay, 
Emma loves to speak. So let's give her a chance to, to tell part of this presentation. Let's give her a chance to present. Or Jimmy really loves analytics. I have this crap project I have to do. <laughs> I really need his help. But if he, can, if he does a great job, I'm telling everyone he did it. And here's the thing that I really want to impress upon leaders. A lot of insecure leaders feel like they have to take credit for everything. But when someone is working for you and they do something really great and you give them the floor and you shine the spotlight on them, it makes you a generous leader and it's a reflection on you. You don't need to steal their thunder. If anything, lift them up. It makes you look better. So that's an easy one. And if you really want to go big, you say, you know, there's an all hands call for the company. I need my person on that call. They need to be featured. They need to tell their story. Okay. Now you're just blowing calls. people away right now. Now, 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 now you're taking them way, <laughs> way out there, which is great. And the so I love how she wrapped that up as we had a, just cut it off right there. She's talking about the idea of lifting up other people on your team. It's really practical. We often are the leaders, the speakers, we get all the credit, but actually their team should get more of the credit. And I love how Lindsay brought that back to the forefront to make sure we didn't forget it. But we've got one more great, amazing speaker to show up here tonight on the Best of Rock the Stage show. We're going to go back to one of the largest, fastest, amazing discussions we had in 2023 when we sat down with film director Sergio Navarita. Sergio is an international award-winning director who is fiercely passionate about bringing meaningful content to the screen. Navarita had a feature film called The Cuban, and it starred Oscar Award winner Lou Gossett Jr., one of my all-time favorite actors. We got into our conversation that night. We titled the show Creativity Unleashed. And as we pick up the conversation, we're getting deeper and deeper into the releasing the inner creativity that sometimes we hold back. Here's Sergio Navarino. Talk through that tension there. What's it like to be a creative, but you haven't released that creativity? Well, you know, when I, um, I worked with Real Works in New York and Being Black in Canada, two organizations where I was a mentor. And, and I think what I learned from that is that all voices matter. And we have an innate gift in us to be creative and you know i was watching a series last night um with my family on gaia on a network and they were talking about the science behind you know the universe and where ideas come from and you know tapping so i, I don't know i think um i have this feeling that the most creative geniuses um of our time and even in history figured out how to tap that uh whether it's a uh, you know, divine spiritual connection or whether yeah. ideas are somewhere in the ether and you, you become a vessel to channel those ideas. I'm not sure, but, um, definitely I think when, when we're, when we go to sleep at night and we're in that dream state or when we wake up, we say, you know, there's something familiar here going on. I know I'm meant to be creative, but the world is telling me to go get a job and, you know, go pay the rent. So, I definitely feel that tug of war and I don't know if it's some sinister intention. That's like a global effort to shut down creativity, which hopefully is not the case. But, um, but I think as we move forward, like I said earlier, we have to find ways to harness that creativity and really encourage children who are born geniuses, according to NASA. And then that genius is beat out of them by the time they're 10, 10, 12, 15 years old. I mean, that's Get back inside the box, terrifying. Inside the box. Yeah. Whereas creativity is the expression of there is no box and it's ever right. expanding, which again, that's why I love film and creative uh, people like you that bring the, the stories and the image to life. You bring that creativity. Uh, you know, when I was watching the Cuban, it's not just the acting. And again, Lou Gossett doesn't speak a lot because of the Alzheimer's, but then you add the music and there is a story being told through creative elements that you get sucked into. Where does that come from for you? Is, is this innate for you? Is this something you, is it in that dream state where it comes out or is this a planning board? You do the process of the board. Where, where does all that come from? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I learned at some point to stop believing my thoughts and, uh, you know, because our brains lie to us all the time to either keep us safe or we're just running old records. Um, so I try to get into that flow state and, you know, I started in music and, um, 
and through life experience, I, I sort of draw on all the elements. I did early on study acting just so I can understand actors in their process and respect what they do. So that was helpful. Um, and so, you know, I found that directing was the only job where I could sort of um, bring in all those elements and, and draw from, from life experience. And, and it also, it uh, keeps me stimulated. I think if I did one thing, I would be bored. Because you're producing, you're, you're, you're directing, you're interacting with people with the emotion, the drama, the drama of the scene, the drama offstage very often, producers and money. You're, you're, your mind's got to be going a hundred different directions. And then you say action and the world stops. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, that's why I've taken up Aikido and, and Qigong and other things because I have to, to learn how to, so technology like these wonderful devices yeah. that keep us connected to the world. Um, I found that I started having trouble focusing and for, for a person who was very introverted as a kid and I could like laser focus on something I was interested in what happened. So so I have to kind of like retrain myself to, to be able to focus. So you're right. When I do call action, I'm in complete Zen state. I mean, there could be bombs going off in the background and they often are in, on a film set and producers freaking out. And, you know, there, there's always some drama going on somewhere out there. But my focus is really being there for the actors. And and I learned that whatever, you know, none of the drama is important. Uh, you know, it's fun to tell in interviews and an anecdotally, but all people care about is what's in that frame. Yeah. And so I have to respect that and, uh, and really train my mind to, to focus on what's important. So what are some of those rituals or best practices you have to get in that flow state to keep creativity at the forefront of what you do? Yeah. So, uh, you know, my background, my heritage is, is Italian. My parents were Italian immigrants. They moved to Canada. And so we're, we're very, uh, I'm going to make a massive generalization a statement, but we're, we tend to be highly emotional and, uh, you know, explosive and our emotions are all over the place. Yeah. So what's interesting about emotions is uh, we experience them and they sort of uh, reflect back to us what we're experiencing in the world. And what I've learned over time is just, not to stay in those states for very long. So we all get upset. We all get sad, happy, but it's, it's, I think um, you have to be the curator of, of those emotions. And uh, certainly when you're doing a film or a TV show or any kind of creative endeavor, um, if you're stressed, you can't be, you can't be at the top of your game. And it's like an athlete, right? You don't want to bring your, you know, your personal dramas onto the field, you have to be completely there in service of the, of the, of the fans, of the audience, of the team and, and do the job you were paid that, you know, called to do. So walk me through a little bit about the development. I mean, you've, you've done multiple projects, but the Cubans most recently one, walk me through the process. Does the story come to you? Does the script kind of beam in is a collaborative thing because some people love collaborative creativity. It feeds the engine, the juices. Some of them are like, I, I got to get my spice set before I bring in other people's. How does it work for Sergio? Um, if people are honest, I think uh, for me, it's, it's always personal. It's always per like, you know, the Cuban thing came from, you know, my father's obsession with Cuba and our debates about it. And, you know, we were always butting heads about it. And so I, I went to Cuba wanting to hate it. And then I fell in love with just the the warm, incredible culture that it is. So it, it changed my life. Um, so, yeah, I, it, that was sort of like I'm driving down the highway. I drive a lot. I love those long country country road. Uh, you know, uh, I love being in the car and, and that's where I do my best work. And uh and then Alessandra, my uh, collaborator and partner, she's a writer. So often we, uh, you know, we'll um, just kind of riff on ideas. And it, it, you know, it's strange. Something could have happened 20 years ago, and it suddenly ties into what we're talking about. So a lot, a lot of this is subconscious, or it just kind of like gets downloaded. Because um, right now I'm thinking a lot about, um, thinking a lot about, you know, this so-called midlife crisis that. A lot of men I know are going through an identity crisis and the whole gender thing. And I think there's a lot of confusion out there. So I, I've been thinking a lot about that. And so that, you know, that may end up in a film or 
a play or a short story or who knows. But uh, that that's how it works for me. It, it just could be at the supermarket. Just boom, you get an idea. So so you don't have that space. Like I, I love whiteboards. I, I do and I brain dump and my creative engine starts in the middle of the night. And I, I, I wake up and I've used my phone in the middle of the night. Write this idea down. Don't forget about this. Or, or I wake up and I'm right away to a tablet. I got to get it out of the. Is that part of it? Or do you really have kind of a more of a controlled flow of being in the car and block everything else? Yeah, it's. um. It was like trial by fire for a long time and just like a fury of like travel, film festivals, this, that and the other. And ideas would somehow come in, in the midst of the chaos. And what Alessandra and I learned most recently is that we need to be in a complete, uh, you know, centered state in order to do our best work. And then we come together intentionally to create. So we, we have to start scheduling that time. And we really looked at the 80-20 rule. You know, we, we noticed that our days when we looked at our calendars were like 80, 90 percent meetings, administrative work, pitch meetings. And it's like, wait a second. Where the, where the juice is, where the gold is, is on the creative stuff. So let's flip that and let's spend 80% of our time creating and coming up with ideas. So this year we came up with, I mean, we have eight or nine projects on our slate, everything from animations to documentary to feature film to limited series. Uh, and then the podcast, of course. So, yep. so it works. I mean, you know, we have to look back in history, the, the Leonardo da Vinci's, the whoever's like they they created that space and they created the environment in order for that to be able to happen. You know, it's, it's really good that you kind of bring that up because years ago, I be being a creative myself and my, I, my brain is a movie reel. I see everything in visuals all the time. Um, I had some people sit me down and say, you know, you're, you're, you're a good leader. You're a good administrator, but you're really great at this thing of creativity and visionary leadership do you ever just disappear for a day? Do you have intentional blacked off time to let yourself be in that creative space where nothing else is more important? I said, no. Again, I got calls. I got bookings. I got meetings. And they said, cut half your stuff out, get in your sweet spot, and we will follow it. How liberating do you think that is for people to hear that they're allowed to be in that sweet spot and actually shut off the rest of it for a while? On a regular basis. It's so important. And we're never taught that, you know, I had to struggle with that because of my immigrant upbringing and that work, that insane work ethic that I have to be hustling and working hard and suffering in order to achieve success. And uh, what I realize now it's quantity over quality. And, you know, those deep think moments, uh, you know, I just came back from the Caribbean. That was very hard for me to shut off my phone and just be. And, uh, but, the, but that's what I need. And that's sometimes you need that, or you need to go to the South of France and sip rosé and some people, wow, that's frivolous or that, you know, you're just, you're just on vacation, but they don't understand that the work happens when you're asleep, when you're, yes. and I tell young directors this all the time and young artists is like, you have to be a director on the subway. You have to be a director on the toilet, in the shower, wherever you are, you have to embody those elements uh, because you just never know when you're going to be called on to to do something or or when you get that brilliant flash it could be in the shower right so you have to be ready again what a way to wrap up the best of 2023 with Sergio talking about embodying being a director 24 7 even in the bathroom <laughs> which I never thought we would ever have discussed on a show but that's part of the reason it made it into the top top list of 2023 don't forget rock the stage every week 7 p.m wednesday nights and we bring some of the greatest celebrities entertainers influencers public speakers authors and the list goes on and on and why do we do this each and every week we want to help you shine on camera shine on stage and learn from amazing influence from around the globe come on back and join us again next week we'll be right back here at 7 p.m eastern time and once again, we do want to thank Adavita Studios for powering Rock the Stage Show. Adavita makes it possible that we turn this show now into an audio podcast as well. And if you want to learn how your podcast, your audio books can be produced, engineered, and elevated to a new level, reach out to Adavita Studios.
TriggerRich.com. Hey, until next week on the Trigger Rich Bond Trigger, we'll see you right back here at 7 p.m. Eastern time for another edition of the Rock to State Show. Have a great week.